Welcome to Anchor Bible School. We're glad you're here. We have exciting days ahead in studying particularly Bible prophecy. But before we get into our study today, we want to ask for the Lord's guidance. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for God to be present with us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne today with gratefulness in our hearts because we know that you are sitting on the throne of the universe and nothing escapes your attention. We live in momentous times. We live in a great uh, time of world history. And we know that prophecy is so important at this time. We need to understand it so that we can share it with others. And so, Father, we ask that as we begin this class, that your Holy Spirit will be present here, that we might receive the Holy Spirit's instruction. We might learn and have the capacity to share this message with the world at large. We thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go directly to our outline. We are, first of all, going to deal with some introductory matters. And as I mentioned, everything that we are going to study is in our outline, in that particular order. Now, the first thing that I want us to take a look at is the basic types of Bible prophecy that we are going to be taking a look at. The first type of Bible prophecy is what is called apocalyptic prophecy. Now, what is apocalyptic prophecy? Basically, it has to do with the great chain prophecies of Scripture, like Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 17. Now, these prophecies have only one fulfillment. One fulfillment. I want to read this statement from my former teacher, Gerhard Hazel, at the seminary, where he explains what apocalyptic prophecies are. He says this, and this is in your outline, dual or twofold fulfillments may be present in some biblical predictions where contextual scriptural indications make this clear and when the details of the specifications are met in each instance. On the other hand, apocalyptic prophecy as found in the books of Daniel and Revelation, has but one fulfillment for each symbol. In other words, there are not two fulfillments for the lion of Daniel 7. There are not two fulfillments for the bear or for the leopard or for the dragon beast or the ten horns. There is only one fulfillment for each symbol in apocalyptic prophecy. And that's important because some people are finding reapplications even of the chain prophecies Uh, to events that are happening in the world today. And we're going to see that that actually destroys historicism. It destroys the idea that prophecy fulfills in a change so that we can know exactly where we are at any given moment in the course of history. So the first type of prophecy that we're going to take a look at is apocalyptic prophecy. Then there's a second type of prophecy, and that's classical prophecy. Uh, And I have some examples here in our syllabus. Uh, For example, uh, Jeremiah 50 and 51. Those chapters deal with the fall of ancient Babylon. It's a prediction about the fall of Babylon in the days of uh, Belshazzar. However, many of the details that we find in classical prophecy is fulfilled on a larger scale in the future. So in other words, uh, the the fact that it's classical prophecy doesn't mean that it was only fulfilled with the literal historical event in the Old Testament. Many of the details then become symbolic or illustrative of events that take place at the end of time. For example, ancient Babylon, we know according to Jeremiah 51, uh, sat on many waters and the waters were dried up. Now that kind of rings a bell when we come to the book of Revelation where it says that the harlot sits on many waters and the waters of the Euphrates will be dried up. And so classical prophecy was fulfilled in the Old Testament, but the fulfillment in the Old Testament then becomes a figure or an illustration of a greater fulfillment in the future. Are you following me? 
Now let's take a look, uh, by the way let me just read this statement also from Gerhard Hassel, this is in the book 70 Weeks Leviticus and the Nature of Prophecy, page 289, the previous one was in the same book, page 322, this is what he said, a dual fulfillment may be recognized only if scripture demands an initial and partial fulfillment and later scripture clearly indicates a final and complete fulfillment. So in other words, uh, scripture has to be clear that there is a later fulfillment to this classical prophecy. We can't just, you know, impose the Old Testament story on the future. There has to be clear biblical indications in the text that these things have a greater fulfillment in the future, like what I mentioned a few moments ago, in the waters, Babylon sits on many waters and the waters of the Euphrates were dried up. We know then that the story of Jeremiah 50 and 51 has a greater fulfillment at the end of time because the terminology that is used in the classical prophecy reappears later on in scripture. Now let's go to our third type of Bible prophecy and this type of prophecy we are going to dedicate most of our time to here in our class. It's what I call typological prophecy. And what do we mean by typological prophecy? It means that in the Old Testament you have the type or you have the small scale model and then that type or small scale model is fulfilled in the future. Now let me just mention here what we have in parentheses. The sanctuary is uh, a prophetic type, isn't it? Because it illustrates the different steps the different events of Christ's ministry, Christ's ministry of salvation. The Hebrew feasts are also uh, prophetic types because they point to future events. And what's interesting is the sanctuary gives us the events of Messiah's plan of salvation. The feasts give us the calendar or give us the dates for those events that are found within the sanctuary. So in other words, the sanctuary and the feasts are typological. The feasts give us the events and the, the, uh, the feasts, excuse me, give us the calendar and the sanctuary provides the events of Messiah's plan of salvation. Uh, Matthew 24, we're going to take a look at in a few moments more, uh, in more detail, uh, is a typological prophecy. Uh, Elijah, the story of Elijah in the Old Testament, is a typological prophecy. It has a historical root, it took place in the Old Testament, however uh, we know that there is also a New Testament Elijah. New Testament Elijah is John the Baptist, very clearly Jesus identified John the Baptist as Elijah. There's an Elijah during the Middle Ages, we know that because Jezebel is active during the church of Thyatira, the fourth church of Revelation and Jezebel cannot appear by herself. If Jezebel is there, Elijah must be there also. Are you with me? Now uh, there's an end time Elijah also, because uh, Malachi chapter 4 says that God is going to send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is the second coming. And so really the historical Elijah becomes a type of the New Testament Elijah, a type of the Middle Ages Elijah and a type of the end time Elijah. So uh, we're dealing here with typology, we're dealing with a small scale illustration that is fulfilled later on on a larger scale. You know the, trans, the Mount of Transfiguration is a typological prophecy, what happened there? You say how is that? Well on the Mount you have three individuals, three key individuals besides the Apostles. You have Jesus, and you have Moses, and you have Elijah. There you have a typological prophecy, the spirit of prophecy makes it very very clear. First of all you have Moses. Moses died, resurrected, and went to heaven. He is a type of those individuals who will die and Jesus will resurrect when he comes again to take to heaven. Elijah was translated to heaven from among the living, and so he represents those who will be translated to heaven without seeing death. And then of course in the middle we have Jesus Christ who makes it all possible. 
And so you have a little miniature illustration of the second coming of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so there you have, in the New Testament, you have a type. Not only do you have types in the Old Testament, you also have types in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, so then you also have various stories from Genesis and from the book of Revelation and also the book of Daniel. Uh, Genesis, the flood story, for example, is typological. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is typological. Those of you who have seen the series Cracking the Genesis Code have seen that every story in the book of Genesis is a typological story. You know, Jesus, for example, the flood, we're going to study it later on in this class. Jesus said that the story of the flood is typological. As it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Very clearly, it's type anti-type. Jesus also said, as it was in the days of Lot. And so we need to examine the entire story of Sodom and Gomorrah because the entire story is typological of the end times. Even the fact that three angels came to Abraham. Interesting. Why three angels came to Abraham? Is it perhaps true that the messages that they deliver are in the same order as the messages of the three angels of Revelation chapter 14? When we examine scripture, we find that it is so. And so we're dealing with typology. Now I want to use one particular example uh, that we have in our syllabus, and that is the prophecy of Matthew 24. I have a whole series of 14 presentations on Matthew 24. I'm only going to deal with one particular aspect, and that is the typological nature of this prophecy of Matthew chapter 24. Now, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him two questions. I want you to notice what those two questions, this is at the bottom of the first page of your syllabus. Notice what the two questions were. Tell us, when will these things be? Jesus had just said that not one stone would be left upon another in the temple, the Jewish temple, and the wall. And so the disciples now say, when are these things going to be? And then they ask a second question. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Are those two questions, two separate questions? Absolutely. Now the disciples thought it was one. <laughs> because the disciples thought that if the temple was destroyed, that was the second coming. That was when Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. But Jesus knew that these were two different events. And so... Ellen White makes it very clear that in his answer, Jesus used the law of typology. In other words, in the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus saw a type or an illustration, a small scale model of what's going to happen with regards to the world at the end of time. You see, what happens in typology is that that which is small scale becomes very large scale. In other words, the true fulfillment of Matthew 24 is not what happened in relation to uh, literal Jerusalem. That is only a small-scale illustration, like the sanctuary is a small-scale illustration of global events and spiritual events at the end of time. Now, I want to read some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White clearly shows that Matthew 24 is using the law of typology, the third type of prophecy that we're discussing as we begin our study. She uses the law of type and anti-type, and she uses many different interesting terms to describe this relationship between type and anti-type. And I want to read these statements, and I want to underline certain words that we find here. Uh, the first one is found in The Great Controversy, page 25. This is at the top of page 2 of your syllabus. This is how Ellen White describes the intentions of Jesus. The prophecy which he uttered was twofold in its meaning. While foreshadowing, see that's an interesting word, foreshadowing the destruction of Jerusalem, it prefigured also the terrors of the last day. The, see the key words there? The key words are foreshadowing, that small scale event foreshadowed, and prefigured. Two words that indicate that what happened on a small scale is going to happen on a larger scale. 
Now there's also a statement in Desire of Ages, page 743, where she uses a different terminology. She says, from the fall of Jerusalem, the thoughts of Jesus passed to what kind of a judgment? To a wider judgment. In the destruction of the impenitent city he saw a, now here comes the key term, a what? He saw a symbol of the final destruction to come upon the world. So she says that what happened at Jerusalem was symbolic of something that would happen in the future on a larger scale. In a larger statement that we find in Desire of Ages, page 628, she had this to say. Jesus did not answer his disciples by taking up separately the destruction of Jerusalem and the great day of his coming. He mingled the description of these two events. Had he opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them, they would, they would have been unable to endure the sight. In mercy to them, he blended, notice, mingled, blended. He blended the description of the two great crises, leaving the disciples to study out the meaning for themselves. When he referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration in that day when the Lord shall rise out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And then she says, the entire, this entire discourse was given, not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. Interesting. Great Controversy, page 22. Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief and rebellion, and hastening on to meet the retributive judgments of God. Also on page 22, Jesus, looking down to the last generation, saw the world involved in a deception similar to that which caused the destruction of Jerusalem. The great sin, of, and now this is very interesting, the great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. And by the way, you know that Christ is the embodiment of the law, right? Christ is the law lived in human flesh. So the great sin of the Jews was to reject Christ, who is the embodiment of the law. She says the great sin of the world would be the rejection of the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and in earth. Let me ask you, is that, are those two sins similar? What's worse? To reject the law or the embodiment of the law? I mean, to reject Christ means to reject the law because Christ is a reflection of the law. And to re reject the law is to reject Christ because the law is a reflection of Christ. So, so both ways, it's the same sin, but looked at from different angles. Are you following me? And that's why Ellen White says that it was similar. You know, for, for a long time I struggled with this. I said, you know, in what way is it similar for them to reject Christ and to reject the law? And then I got to thinking, well, the law is a reflection of Christ. So if the law is a reflection of Christ, if you're rejecting the law, you're rejecting Christ. And if you're rejecting Christ, you're rejecting the law, because the law is a re reflection of Him. Now, notice Great Controversy, page 36. Here's another statement. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have what? Another fulfillment, of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow. Now if you read the first chapter of Great Controversy and you say that's a faint shadow, wow, what is the world going to be like? It is amazing when you read that first chapter of Great Controversy, what happened in Jerusalem. She continues saying, In the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon His law. Going to the next page, notice Ellen White time and again, time and again, says that what happened in Jerusalem is a type or an illustration of future events. Uh, this is in the book Last Day Events, page 18. The whole of the 24th chapter of Matthew is a prophecy concerning the events to precede this event and the destruction of Jerusalem is used to typify the last great destruction of the world by fire. 
She also says in Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 753, while these prophecies received a partial fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. This shows that the anti-type is greater than the type. In other words, the future fulfillment is greater and is the main focus of the type. So she says here uh, in... Uh, Volume 5 of the Testimony, 753. While these prophecies received a partial fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. A couple of statements more. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 120 and 121. Uh, the ruin of Jerusalem was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world. The prophecies that receive a partial fulfillment in the overthrow of Jerusalem have a more direct application to the last days. We are now standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. A crisis is before us, such as the world has never witnessed. And then one final statement, Testimonies to Ministers, page 232. The warnings that Christ gave to Jerusalem were not to end with them. The judgments upon Jerusalem were a symbol of the events of Christ's coming, uh, to judgment in the last day, when before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So are you understanding this relationship between type and anti-type? These are typological prophecies. In other words, the type is a small-scale model of something far greater in the future, of the anti-type. And in Scripture, this method is used repeatedly, time and again. As I mentioned before, the book of Genesis, every story in Genesis is a prophecy. Besides being rooted in history, it did take place literally in history. It becomes a small-scale model of something far greater at the end of time. And there are certain principles that we need to apply uh, when we study these prophecies uh, to understand the future fulfillment. So basically, these are the three types of prophecies that we are going to be using as we study uh, these principles about how to interpret prophecy correctly. So let's go now to principle number one. Principle number one is the most important principle of all. What do you suppose it is? You know, we could have skipped that one. It's, that's automatic. We, we know we have to do that. But it has to be put as number one. Because without the help of the divine spirit, we're going to undoubtedly reach error in our conclusions. So let's go through this uh, very quickly here, principle number one. The Holy Spirit imparted the message of Scripture to the various writers. Therefore we must pray that the same spirit that inspired the prophetic writings will explain their meaning to us today. After all, we removed 2,000 years from when these books were given in different language, a different culture, uh, to do different individuals, so we need divine guidance. And we must come to prophecy with the willingness to practice what we learn. Because Jesus said, you know, uh, if we don't, then we won't, we won't know whether this is of God or not. Ellen White has a couple of very interesting statements here regarding the importance of prayer. Uh, Christian Education, page 59, she says, Never. What does never mean? Never. Exactly that. <laughs> never should the Bible be studied without prayer. Yeah, many times don't we open the Bible and we start studying it without praying? Every time we open the Bible, we should pray. Amen. Never should the Bible be studied without prayer. Before opening its pages, wow, before opening its pages, we should ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and it will be given. It's a divine promise. So if we pray here at the Anchor Bible School, do you suppose the Holy Spirit's going to be here to instruct us? I believe so. Another statement that we find in Councils on Sabbath School Work, page 38, uh, we find uh, why we need to pray before 
opening the scriptures. There are actually two reasons. And you'll notice that the numbers I've placed in brackets, I've added those so that we see that there are two points that Ellen White is trying to make here. She says, the Bible should never be studied without prayer. The Holy Spirit alone can cause us to feel the, here's the first reason, the what? The importance of those things easy to be understood. So the first reason to pray is so that the Holy Spirit can show us the importance of what we study. Or, now there, there's the other reason, or what? Prevent us from resting. That's not talking about resting and sleep. It's with a W. Resting means twisting. Resting truths difficult of comprehension. So in other words, God reveals His truth to us and He keeps us from embracing error by twisting the Scriptures. And believe me, there's a lot of Scripture twisting going on these days. Not only outside the church, but inside the church. Because we have a tendency to mold Scripture to our desires and to our likes. And the reason why is because we're not praying to God for divine enlightenment, saying, Lord, show me what your will is, Amen. not what my will is. And if you show me, I'll abide by it and I'll obey, I will obey it. Amen. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. That should be our attitude when we come to Scripture. So I place that principle there because I believe that it is the most important. And, uh, you know, it has the smallest space because it, it's self-explanatory. You don't have to have the intelligence of a rocket scientist to understand this principle. That we need to ask for divine guidance every time we open the Scriptures. When we study our Sabbath school lesson. You know, when the sermon is about to be preached, wouldn't it be nice for us to sit there in the pew and to say, oh, the pastor is about to deliver the message and raise up a little prayer to the Lord that the Lord will be, be with the preacher as he preaches his sermon? Absolutely. Every time we should pray before we open God's holy word because without divine wisdom, we cannot interpret the Bible correctly. Now let's go to principle number two. You're saying, wow, we're on a roll here. We're on page three already. Well, you don't, don't uh, sing victory yet because uh, these first principles are uh, actually the simplest and the easier uh, principles. Later on, we're going to get into some very complex things. Principle number two. Ask questions of the text that you are studying and then seek for answers to your questions. You know, many times we just read the Bible and we don't ask the Bible questions. I'm not saying in the sense of doubting what the Bible says, but questions so that we can understand the text. Let's go through this principle uh, as it is in the syllabus. Before we begin to interpret a biblical text or passage, we must first of all read it carefully. Several times in as many Bible versions as possible. Each Bible version will give you a different dimension. And as you read, ask the text questions. You know, it's interesting, when Jesus met the religious leaders in the temple, if you read uh, Luke 2, 46 and 47, the religious leaders of Israel were not so amazed by what Jesus said, but by the questions that Jesus asked. And so when we come to Scripture, we must come to Scripture with an active mind, with a clear mind, with an inquisitive mind, with a perceptive mind, with a mind that is engaged with the biblical text. In other words, Bible study, particular prophe particularly prophecy, is like detective work. We, we seek for clues here, there, everywhere, and then we bring all of the clues together and we are able to make sense out of the passage that we're studying. Now let me give you some examples. Uh, and you have some material, a material there that says um, God's great week. God's great week. You see that one there? It's one of the other handouts that you receive with the syllabus. The first two questions here in the syllabus have to do with this material, God's Great Week. 
Now, for many, many years, I struggled with two things in the book of Genesis as I read the, the, the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2. And I struggled, not in a bad sense of the word, that I doubted what Genesis was saying, but um, I struggled with two questions. Number one, if the Sabbath is as important as we Seventh-day Adventists believe, why didn't God give Adam and Eve a direct command in the Garden of Eden to keep the Sabbath? You know, it would have been so simple for God because people say, well, no, the Sabbath was for the Jews. And when you tell them, no, but it's in Genesis, they say, but God doesn't say that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. That's God rested. So I thought many times, I said, it would be wonderful if God had placed in there, Adam and Eve, keep the Sabbath. And then, you know, it, the, the problem would be resolved. No problem whatsoever. It's not for the Jews. It was for Adam and Eve and for the human race. But you don't find any direct command in Genesis to keep the Sabbath. Interesting. And then another thing that I struggled with for many years was why each day had an evening and a morning except the seventh day. See, that's, this is what I'm talking about when, we say we, when I say that we need to be inquisitive and we need to have an active mind. You know, we, we need to say, why does the scripture say it this way? What's missing? Why was this word used? Why was this phrase used? What is the meaning of this word? What is the meaning of this phrase? We need to be engaged with the text, in other words. We need to ask the text questions and then seek for answers to those questions. The second question was, why does each day have an evening and a morning except for the seventh day? It doesn't say there was the evening and the morning of the seventh day. And uh, one teacher once said to me, well, probably Moses forgot to put it in there. <laughs> and I said to him, I don't think so. Everything that should be in Scripture is in Scripture. Amen. There's a reason, there's a theological reason why the seventh day doesn't say that there was an evening and a morning. And so for years, I'll be honest with you, for years I struggled with these questions until I was on a trip to uh, Panama, I remember. I had the book Patriarchs and Prophets with me, and I was reading the chapter on creation. Reading it again, because I'd read it many times. And I read a little blurb there, where I said, wow, I have the answer to my two questions now. And you say, well, where is that statement? It's in this material, and unfortunately I did not put page numbers on this material, so it might be a little bit of a struggle for you to find this, uh, but it's, uh, it's under the subtitle that says uh, Spirit of Prophecy. There's a subtitle that says, When was the Sabbath sanctified and blessed? And then on the next page, the Spirit of Prophecy. And the first statement there is the one that, uh, that really caught my attention. And I said, wow, now I understand why God did not give a direct command and why the seventh day did not have an evening and a morning. It says there, uh, and I want to read two or three of these statements, you know, for years I had thought that uh, that first Sabbath when it was beginning, God ended his work the sixth day, and when the seventh day was beginning, God said to Adam and Eve, okay, Adam and Eve, this is going to be a holy day, so keep it. But I was wrong. Because, because that first Sabbath day, God did not command Adam and Eve to worship and keep holy that first Sabbath day. And you say, well, why not? Well, let's, let's read what Ellen White had to say. See, the little old lady didn't have a theological education, but she had the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some people say Ellen White wasn't a theologian, so I tell them, well, then the Holy Spirit isn't a theologian, right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the greatest theologian. And that's why what Ellen White says is amazing. Notice, when did the Sabbath become holy? Did this, was the Sabbath holy when the, that first Sabbath began, or did the Sabbath become holy, become holy when the day ended? The Sabbath became holy when it ended, because you know what? It was God's rest that made the Sabbath holy. Are you with me? Ellen White never got it wrong. It would have been very easy for Ellen White, you know, she was, she was a strong believer in the Sabbath. It would have been very easy for Ellen White to put in her writings, and God told Adam and Eve, you keep this Sabbath now. But she never says that. Notice these statements. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47. And I'm not going to go through all of this material. I hope that you'll go through it. Don't, don't just file this stuff away. 
This took me months to put together. So, so uh, please spend the time to read this material. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. Notice, after resting upon the seventh day, what does the word after mean? Exactly that, after. After resting upon the Sabbath day, God sanctified it. When did God make the Sabbath holy? After he rested. So was the Sabbath holy during that Sabbath day? No, it became holy after he rested. Because what makes the Sabbath holy is God's rest. That's why Sunday can't be holy, because God didn't rest that day. After resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it, or set it apart as a day of rest for man. When did the Sabbath become a day of rest for man? After, After the first Sabbath. Notice the next text, now I'm preaching. <laughs> the Desire of Ages, page 281. Listen carefully. Because he had rested upon the Sabbath. Because what? past tense, because he had rested upon the Sabbath, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did God bless the Sabbath and sanctify it? Because he had rested. Set it apart to a holy use. When was it set apart? After he rested. And when did he give it to Adam? He gave it to Adam. When did he give it to Adam? After he made it holy. He gave it to Adam. As a day of rest. It was, a, it was a memorial of the work of creation and thus a sign of God's power and of His love. In the book My Life Today, page 259, speaking about the Lord's Day that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Most people say, most Christians say, oh, that's Sunday, I was in the Spirit on Sunday. No, no, no. Ellen White explains, the Lord's Day mentioned by John was the Sabbath, the day on which Jehovah rested after the great work of creation, and which he blessed and sanctified because he had rested upon it. Why did he bless and sanctify it? Because he what? Because he had rested. Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 247. God blessed and sanctified the seventh day because he rested upon it from all his wondrous work of creation. And on the next page, this is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 111. The first six days of each week are given to man for labor because God employed the same period of, of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor. Why? In commemoration of the Creator's rest. So whose rest is significant? The Creator's rest. Man, when man rests, he is commemorating, commemorating the Creator's rest. That's why in the Bible, God says, the Sabbath is my holy day. Because it's His holy day before it is our holy day. Amen. One final statement. Review and Herald, September 16, 1862. Instead of keeping God's own rest day, which He sanctified after He had rested upon it, and set it apart for man to observe and reverence they, that is Protestants, honor a papal institution. Now let's take a look at this. Is it important to ask the text questions? You know, we might not even think of that question. In fact, somebody said to me, what, the, what difference does it make whether, whether it was sanctified you know, as the day was beginning or was it sanctified when the day ended? What difference does it make? It makes a big difference. You know, the main argument that is used by Dale Retzlaff, who is an enemy of Adventists, used to be an Adventist, and others, is that the Sabbath is not a creation institution because God did not command Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath. But now we know that God did not command Adam and Eve to rest because the Sabbath did not become holy until the day ended. How could God tell Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath holy if it was not yet holy? Are you with me? Furthermore, how could God say to Adam and Eve, keep the Sabbath according to my example before God gave the example? Are you with me? And even further, Adam and Eve could not have kept the fourth commandment that first Sabbath. 
Because the fourth commandment says work six and rest the seventh. And they had not worked six. <laughs> so is this significant? This is a very significant question. And when we engage the text, when we ask the questions of the text, you know, we, we reach some amazing conclusions that are extremely important. Now, what about the evening and the morning? See, the problem is, if we think of this first week as man's week, then we can't explain the fact that there's no evening and morning to the seventh day. But when we remember that the first week is God's week, the first week is not man's week. It's God's week. Because God works six, and God rested the seventh. The first week has nothing to do with man. It is God's week. Now, the seventh day, God finishes his work the sixth day. The seventh day, he, he ceases his work. Incidentally, the word Shabbat, you'll find in this material, does not mean rest, quality of rest. It means to cease. The word rest there means simply to not do anymore. It means to cease doing something, to stop doing something. And we use that, that, that word in the same way today. When a uh, trial is going on and the district attorney has finished presenting his case, he says, the prosecution rests. That means he's going to Hawaii on vacation. <laughs> no, what does that mean? It means I finished presenting my case. I have no more to present. So Sabbath means to cease. So God ceased his work of creation the seventh day. Let me ask you, is God still ceasing from his work of creation? Has God created any other worlds? No. Is God still ceasing? Sure. And you'll find statements from all the here. God is still ceasing from his work of creation because he did not begin a new cycle of creation. So for God... There was no evening and morning of the seventh day. But there is for us, we know, because then God says, now I establish a cycle for you. But it's when we try to argue the week that we know back into the first week of creation that we run into troubles. Are you with me or not? And so the seventh day had no evening and morning for God. But it does have an evening and morning for us. So it is very important for us to ask the text what? To ask the text questions and then search for answers. We're not questioning in the sense of doubting, we're questioning in the sense of wanting clarification. Now let's go back to our syllabus and I hope that you'll read this whole document. There's some incredible statements from Ellen White in, the, in this uh, material as well as lots of biblical material. Now um, we're going to deal with this third question in the syllabus, that is, why was it so urgent to name a successor for Judas before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? For years I wondered, you know, I said, okay, so they thought that they needed to name a successor for Judas. Why? Well, where did they get that idea that they were supposed to name a successor in place of Judas? And then I asked myself as I read Acts chapter 1, didn't they have more important things to do before the day of Pentecost, like praying and ironing out their differences and, and, you know, making everything right and placing all their properties at the disposal of the work. Didn't they have more important things to do than to get together and elect a successor? Wouldn't it have been wiser to wait until the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost? Then with the Holy Spirit, they'd have much better guidance as to who they were supposed to elect. So I thought. But I knew that there had to be a deeper reason as to why they felt it was necessary to elect apostle number 12 and why that apostle needed to be elected before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And I'm going to give you now the reason why and then we're going to take a look at this whole material because it deals with how to interpret the prophecies of the Old Testament that point to the Messiah. It, it, this is an amazing story that we're going to study, the election of the successor of Judas. What was Jesus doing during those 10 days between the ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? You know, we usually think about what the disciples were doing. 
they were in the upper room, they were praying, and they were ironing out their differences, they were placing all of their properties at the disposal of the work. You know, they were doing all of these things in preparation for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But have you ever wondered what happened to Jesus during those ten days? What was Jesus doing between the ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? The simple answer is, and we're going to study this later on in our class, the simple fact is that three things were happening with Jesus during those ten days. First of all, he ascended. That's not one of the three, but he ascended to heaven. And then in heaven, three things happened. Number one, he was clothed with the garments of the high priest by his father because he was going to serve in the sanctuary as the high priest. Secondly, the sanctuary was sanctified or set apart because that's where Jesus was going to serve. And in the third place, Jesus was given the gift of the Father because the gift of the Spirit was not promised to men first, it was promised to Jesus for Jesus to pour out upon us. And so Jesus, during those ten days, was clothed as the high priest. Jesus was anointed to serve as the high priest with the Spirit, and the sanctuary was sanctified or set apart because that's where Jesus was going to serve. Now let's think about this. One of the pieces of clothing that the high priest used was called the breastplate. Ever heard of the breastplate? What did the breastplate have? The breastplate had 12 stones. What did those 12 stones represent? In the Old Testament priesthood, it represented the 12, 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 tribes, of course. Now, when Jesus was clothed as the high priest, what did the 12 stones represent? The 12 tribes as well as what? The 12 apostles. But now here comes the interesting point. How could Jesus be clothed with the breastplate that had 12 stones if there were only 11 apostles? Are you with me? There is a reason for everything in Scripture. But we have to have an inquisitive, active mind, an engaged mind. We can't just read. Jesus didn't say, read the Scriptures. He said, search the Scriptures. The word there is scrutinize. Do you know what scrutinize means? It means to study with a fine tooth comb. Because there are gems that are under the surface. You know, I don't find much gold on the streets of Fresno. <laughs> you have to dig for it. And so it is with scripture. Most of the good stuff is not on the surface. Most of the good stuff is beneath the surface. And we have to dig for it. We have to search for it. Let's go to the next question here. What, how can the harlot of Revelation 17, incidentally in the material you're going to receive, you're going to receive a 22-page document on Revelation 17. Amen. Many questions about Revelation 17. The beast that was, is not, will be, the number eight, seven heads, and there's an eighth. You know, it, it appears to be a very confusing prophecy. It's not confusing, really. It appears confusing, but it isn't when you study it using this method, step by step, studying each symbol and then putting all of the symbols together. You'll see in Revelation 17 that the harlot is sitting on a beast on the waters and on the mountains at the same time. Now how can, how can this woman be seated on the beast, the waters, and the mountains? Well, we'll answer that later on in, in our anchor class. Uh, you know, another thing, what is the Christ-centered uh, reason for Sabbath observance in Exodus 16. We'll also be looking at Exodus, Exodus 16 later on in this class. You know, usually we say, as Adventists, we say, you know, uh, we're supposed to uh, keep the Sabbath because manna didn't fall on the Sabbath. That's, that's good, but it's insufficient. Because it doesn't give us the Christ-centered reason to keep the Sabbath. It simply says, oh, keep the Sabbath, you know, because no manna fell on Sabbath. So what does that have to do with Jesus? Amen. It is a Christless interpretation. Now, it does tell us to keep the Sabbath. Nothing wrong with that. But we need to, there has to be a Christ-centered reason for keeping the Sabbath. See, Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath because their creator 
sanctified the Sabbath, he wants to spend time with them. So there has to be a Christ-centered reason for no manna falling on Sabbath. And we're going to find, you know, and you know, we're going to study this in detail, but really what does the manna represent? The manna represents Christ, but not generally. The manna represents the flesh of Christ. So he said in John chapter 6 and verse 51, he says, the manna that I shall give is my flesh that I shall give for the life of the world. So the manna represents the flesh of Christ. Now let me ask you, what happened when manna fell on Wednesday and people saved it for Thursday? Two things. It bred worms and it stank. Right? Bread worms, isn't that kind of strange that it would breed worms and stink? Huh. Just saving it for, for, from one day to the next, it would breed worms and stink. Now let me ask you, what is it that breeds worms and stinks? A decomposing body. Decomposing flesh. Breeds worms and stinks. Now what happened when the manna was picked up on Friday and saved for Sabbath? It was as fresh on Sabbath as it had been on Friday. And what does the manna represent? The flesh of Jesus. Let me ask you, did the body of Jesus, did the flesh of Jesus see corruption in the tomb? No, because he was what the manna represented. There's your Christ-centered reason. We keep the Sabbath in commemoration of Jesus resting in the tomb in the, on the Sabbath and his flesh not seeing corruption. Wow! That adds a dimension to the issue of the manna, and we'll take a closer look at this later on in the class. Is it important to ask questions? What is the Christ? Everything we study we have to say, what does Christ have to do with this? That's one of our principles. There's a lot of Christless interpretation of prophecy. Like the 2520, you know, that's something that's going around, the 2520 year prophecy. There's no such prophecy in the Bible. The daily. And these things, you know, it's, it's studied totally disconnected from Jesus. But prophecy is about Jesus. It's about, it's about a great Savior. It has to be related to Christ. If it isn't, it might just be false prophecy. Here's another question. What is the central point in the story of the rich man and Lazarus? You know, as I was studying this, I discovered something very interesting. If you want to go with me to Luke 16, Luke chapter 16, and verses 30 and 31, find something very interesting here. You know, I had... I've studied this passage time and time again, and then one day I was sitting down studying it again and asking the text questions. And I said, you know, is there really a difference between, between the beliefs of Abraham and the beliefs of the rich man? And I came across uh, this text that we find in Acts, I mean Luke 16, verses 30 and 31. This is the rich man, and he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Did the rich man believe in the immortality of the soul? Yes. He believed it because he says, if one what? Goes to him from the dead, they will repent. And of course the rich man was dead, right? So if one goes to him from the dead, they will repent. But I want you to notice what Jesus believed. Verse 31. But he said to, them, to him, If they do not hear, this is Abraham and the belief of Jesus. Abraham saw Jesus' day. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What did Abraham believe in? The resurrection of the dead. The rich man believed in someone going from the dead. It's a little nuance, but very important, because it shows that the hope of the Christian is not found in a, a immortal soul, but it's found 
in resurrecting from the dead. Amen. Uh, final question that I want to ask because uh, our time is coming to an end in this first class. How do we relate the various references to the time, times, and dividing of time? 42 months and 1260 days in Revelation 12 and 13. You know that this time period is mentioned in many different ways. 1260 days, time, times, the dividing of time, 42 months. You know, some people say they're not the same period. How can we be sure that they represent the same period of church history? We have to delve into scripture. We have to look at the context. We have to look at what comes before and what comes after. You know, we have to have an inquisitive mind. That's the main point that I want us to understand, folks, is that we cannot simply read the Bible. We have to have an engaged, active mind when we read the Bible, and we have to ask for divine guidance. There are things that I am still struggling with, and when I say struggling with, I'm not saying that, that uh, you know, I doubt the Bible or the inspiration of the Bible, not at all. I'm struggling with understanding some things. There are some things in the writings of Paul, for example, that I still struggle with. And I've been studying them real, really hard. And I'm sure someday, if the Lord doesn't come before, uh, I'll be able to understand them more fully. If not, Jesus will instruct me when, when we get to heaven. But meanwhile, we, we have to study these things. You know, uh, if, if Peter struggled with Paul, and he lived in the same time frame as Paul, well, I guess there's hope for us. Because we live 2,000 years removed. And, uh, you know, Peter said Paul wrote some things that are very difficult to understand. And so, and it would be easier for Peter to say, Paul, you should have been clear in what you wrote. That's not what, that's not what Peter says. Peter says, uh, you know, the unlearned twist to their own destruction. In other words, it's, the problem isn't with Paul. The problem is with us being willing to invest the time and the effort and prayer in struggling with the biblical text and finding answers to the questions that we ask when we've been studying the biblical text. So I hope that as we've studied uh, these uh, uh, principles that uh, we understand the, their importance and that we're willing to invest the time, first of all, to pray, and secondly, to engage the text actively, to search, ask questions, and then seek to find answers to our questions.